So hi, everyone, and welcome to our online talk today with Jane Pavitt and Paul Betts in conjunction with the exhibition German Design 1949 to 1989, Two Countries, One History. Before we begin, please let me remind you that you are welcome to post any questions to the comment section on YouTube, and we will take a look at these later on. You'll also find a digital tour of the exhibition on the Vitra Design Museum's YouTube page. The exhibition is currently on display at the Vitra Design Museum. Although it's currently closed, we hope that it will reopen soon and be on display here until September 2021. The exhibition will then travel to Dresden. We collaborated with the Kunstgewerbe Museum at the Dresden State Art Collections and following its presentation in Weil am Rhein here and in Dresden, the show would tour to further international venues. So um, please let me introduce our two guests that we have with us today. First of all, Jane Pavitt is Professor of Design and Architectural History at Kingston University, London. Prior to Kingston, she was Dean of Humanities at the Royal College of Art in London. And from 1997 to 2010, she was Principal Research Fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum, where she curated numerous exhibitions, including Cold War Modern, Design 1945 to 70, and Postmodernism, Style and Subversion 1970 to 1990. Her most recent work is on high-tech architecture and design, and she co-curated an exhibition on the subject for the Sainsbury Center for Visual Arts. Paul Betts is a professor of modern history at St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford. His research reaches across many themes of material culture and design, cultural diplomacy, memory and nostalgia, human rights and international justice. Among other publications, such as Within Walls, Private Life in the German Democratic Republic, and the Authority of Everyday Objects, A Cultural History of West German Industrial Design. He has also contributed to the recent Vitra Design Museum exhibition catalog for German design. His latest publication, Ruin and Renewal, Civilizing Europe After World War II was published in 2020 and I'm excited uh, to hear about it today. So welcome both of you and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, the exhibition charts the development of design in both Germanys. So the democratic, uh, the German Democratic Republic in the East and the Federal Republic of Germany in the West during the 40 years of German division. The time period covered in the exhibition roughly correlates to the period generally defined as the Cold War. This is a period simultaneously full of anxiety and um, hopefulness across the globe, but managed mainly by two ideologically opposing superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Germany, which was divided in 1949, found itself in the middle of these tensions and thus the unique, the unique case of German double history offers an interesting case of comparison. So Jane, um, let's begin with an event that is not really directly related to Germany, the American National Exhibition in Moscow staged in 1959 the so-called kitchen debate um, between Nikita Khrushchev and Richard Nixon. Uh, I think the photo has become quite iconic with two of the world's uh, superpower leaders looking at refrigerators and um, other consumer goods. Uh, what actually occurred at this highly anticipated event and how did this moment shape a new understanding of the significance of design and material culture during the Cold War as a tool for propaganda? Okay, well, thanks, Erica. It's, it was an enormously important event, and um, and it's been the story has been told in a number of different settings and from different points of view. But effectively, the, the American National Exhibition was the result of a an exchange of exhibitions that came um, after the uh, first uh, the renewal of the. Um, uh, the first World's Fair event in Brussels in uh, 1958, when during, in a spirit of rapprochement, I suppose, um, East and West, Moscow and Washington, uh, decided on the exchange of uh, exhibitions um, as a way to um, uh, uh, signal, an, I suppose, a new form of cultural diplomacy, um, but also because of the attention that had been um, brought, I suppose, to these competing visions of modernity presented in Brussels in 58. Um, so uh, Soviet Union sent an exhibition to New York and the far more uh, uh, closely documented um, American exhibition in Moscow in 1959 brought really a, a, a kind of plethora of um, 
American goods, events, lifestyles, cultural products, um, uh, uh, settings to um, to a very wide public in, in in Moscow that summer, and it included things like um, entire interior home settings in the form of exhibitions being set up, demonstrations of um, uh, cookery and uh, makeup, um, uh, fashion shows, and so forth. The kitchen debate, as it became known was um, part of a staged uh, walkthrough of the exhibition by Khrushchev and um, uh, uh, Vice President Nixon. And they stopped in front of a small yellow fitted kitchen and they had an exchange that was kind of captured by the world's media. And really what came out of that discussion was uh, Nixon, I'll paraphrase saying something around, we could compete in the form of consumer goods, washing machines and refrigerators instead of weapons. And Khrushchev responds rather testily and says, you know, we, we, we will beat you at all this. We will improve ourselves in the next few years and, and we will uh, 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 pass you by as we, as we progress and we will wave as we go. So it was a testy, but a kind of a vuncular, but testy exchange really, which set the picture for Cold War competition in, the, in, the, in terms of design and consumer goods. Why do you think, you, you mentioned that the, the show that was held in the Soviet Union was more publicized. Why, why do you think that was? Um, well, I mean, it, 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 became, it was a larger production. I mean, both exhibitions attracted a great deal of attention, uh, but the planning of the American show was a, a, a no holds barred yeah. uh, uh, extravaganza really. And um, uh, so it, it it had huge coverage in the United States and a different form of coverage, I suppose, in the Soviet Union as well. Yeah. Um, Paul, if we zoom back into Germany, um, there were also countless exhibitions that, uh, well, both in the GDR and in the Federal Republic of Germany that debuted furnishings and homewares kind of similar to the one that Jane was just describing. Um, and these were often also funded by outside sources. In 1952, the exhibition We're Building a Better Life hosted half a million very excited visitors. Around 40% of those, I believe, were from East Germany. Um, this is a time when there was no Berlin Wall yet, right? Um, and there were actors representing dynamic, modern German families amongst their well-designed modern, modern model dwellings. Um, and then another exhibition more geared towards architecture was, of course, the 1957 Interbau exhibition in West Berlin. Um, I think one third of the visitors there were from East Berlin. What were the explicit intentions behind these exhibitions in Germany? And certainly, I mean, for, you know, on the one hand, to sell products maybe from American companies that were, you know, had created subsidiaries like Knoll, uh, in Germany after the war, but but other than that, what, what else? What were the reasons of these exhibitions, and 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 how successful were they really in convincing the general public of a better life in the West? Do you think? Well, I mean, thank you for that. I mean, I think we need to go a little bit back to the situation in Germany after the war. I mean, the kind of story of widespread destruction, unconditional surrender, military occupation, the horrific legacy of Nazism, and that, of course, was a situation in which then everything needed to be remade. So of course there were pressing demands for material reconstruction, economic recovery, political renewal, uh, cultural regeneration, and even the moral makeover of Germany and Germans. So design, design of course is at the very center of these discussions. So that old kind of backbone uh, rallying cry from the spoon to the city uh, was now given enormous historic uh, opportunity. Add to that, of course, the, um, the fact that Germany had now become a flashpoint in this Cold War confrontation and competition, as you say, these kind of dueling exhibitions. I mean, you referred to two West German exhibitions, but of course, you know, the Besser Leben, the kind of uh, better life exhibition in um, East Berlin in 1953, mm -hmm. in which you had these kind of rival shows that were in a sense about housing, furniture, consumer goods on display as kind of emblems of recovery and ideas of the future. Um, that, of course, informed, uh, you know, the construction of Stalin Allee and, of course, as you say, the Interbau exhibition in 1957. So in each case, in this case, it was about kind of Berlin uh, acting as a kind of um, display window for different political systems, one in which uh, mass housing and the welfare states became symbols of political legitimacy. 
And so I think that's in a sense the point. I mean, it's a story of cultural idealism and also a situation in which uh, these governments want to deliver particular images of the good life as a kind of bedrock of um, what political loyalty to either one of these um, cultural regimes would actually entail. So they use these kind of housing material objects as a way of kind of marking out um, what will be the future of these. So they take on very, very large uh, political significance in terms of the, of the importance of mass housing as a kind of litmus test um, for these new political regimes. Mm. Um, I think you, uh, a minute ago, Jane, you mentioned the, um, the, internet, the Expo uh, 58 in Brussels. Um, this was the first World's Fair that, to take place after World War II. Um, this also hosted millions of visitors and, uh, you know, was to convey a new beginning as well. Um, West Germany had this kind of stunning pavilion that was built by Sepp Ruf and Egon Eiermann, who was the designer ultimately of most of the furnishings inside the building. Um, I guess I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on some of the underlying tensions at the Brussels World's Fair generally. Um, there were lots of more important pavilions, maybe one could say, uh, the Soviet Union, the United States Pavilion. Um, what were some of the happenings at that, uh, that event and, and how were they, well, well, one thing at a time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the West German Pavilion was an enormously important and influential presentation. Um, so um, it was one of the many variants of modernism uh, uh, present um, at the event. And one could say that the, the Brussels Expo was an opportunity to present modernism from both sides of the, of the, of the Iron Curtain. So there were forms of socialist modern as well as, um, if you like, what, what Greg Castillo has called the kind of, you know, the legacy of a Marshall Plan modernism uh, 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 with, um, uh, uh, with uh, the development of a kind of um, form of democratic modernism um, framed around um, uh, kind of Western ideals. So, I mean, the, the, so, but there are a number of competing um, uh, uh, scenarios, I suppose, for where design features in this exhibition. And you used the phrase anxiety and hopefulness earlier, and I think that really does sum up what the, the mood of the expo was. I mean, it was de devoted to peace, prosperity, and progress. Um, and one of its uh, um, still standing symbols was the atomium, the Brussels atomium, which, which kind of um, symbolized a, a huge faith in um, the benefits of science. Uh, what science would bring to the um, to the to the new age, but of course there's the shadow of uh, nuclear conflict um, uh, behind that. I mean, one of the most interesting presentations I think was the uh, uh, pavilion designed for um, the company Philips by Corbusier, mm. which was a co parabolic concrete structure inside of which was a kind of immersive film and sound installation, which showed pretty kind of terrifying images, I think, of um, both conflict and anxiety, and then images of kind of rebirth and hopefulness set against a very discordant electronic soundtrack by Edgar Varese. So there was this kind of bound up in these images of um, uh, progress and utopia were some pretty kind of dystopian scenarios, I, I, I suppose. Mm. And at the same time, oh, please. Well, I was just going to say a couple of things. I, I agree with Jane completely, but you know, the Western Pavilion was quite interesting in terms of, again, showcasing the kind of best of West German design. Uh, and it's really the strong idea of a kind of good form. But you know, the theme of the Western Pavilion was this idea of the Scheidenheit, this idea of modesty, that they were very clearly trying to um, convey a strong message. This was you know, in reaction to the 1937 Trocadero show, which is kind of a Nazi megalomania on display. This is one in which it's about kind of low level buildings, kind of uh, modest objects as a kind of effort to uh, convey a different kind of West Germany. But there were controversial elements. There was a, there was a big wooden um, map at the very center of it, uh, which basically um, was the map of Germany in 1937, uh, with of course suggesting that the old Prussian territories that had been ceded to Poland at the end of the Second War would be, was in a sense, part of the idea of West Germany, which not surprisingly uh, didn't go down well with Polish journalists in terms of what they felt to be the revanchist uh, kind of fantasies about that particular map. So it's a kind of interesting 
pavilion, which is a kind of a mix of hyper-modern industrial goods, but also seemingly kind of an older uh, political agenda in terms of what actually counts uh, as West Germany with this idea of the kind of virtues of a modest West Germany that's learned the lessons of the past. Hmm. Is it, would you say that it's, po either one of you, would you say that it's possible to um, read the anxieties of this period in some of these kind of well-designed uh, products, specifically in the German pavilion, I'm thinking of brown products, electronic objects, or is that a stretch? Jane, you want to come in or what? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about brown products as, a, a, as evident, I mean, evidence of a technological anxiety necessarily. I suppose a control of technology and a, and, and a view to d domesticate it. I think mm. what Paul's saying about the, the, the agenda to domesticate and make comfortable, make modest, is probably a theme that you, you see throughout the exhibition, but also throughout the period, the way in which, um, you know, home is important as form of kind of shelter and protection, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, key to expressing sort of social values, I think. Um, so yes, I mean, there, clearly there is a huge uh, uh, undertone of, of perhaps anxiety around technology, um, but the overall message of the exhibition was that technology would be har harnessed for the good of mankind as, as it was expressed in those days. Um, so I think that's the, certainly that's the message of the organizers. And I think each pavilion, you know, um, often had its, its sort of oddities. And Paul's description of the West German pavilion is really good, that sense that there are off, there is sometimes objects found within these pavilions that kind of show that unease, I think, below the surface. Yeah, but there's also, I think, this interesting kind of contrast with what you all are saying about this idea, this notion of like Heimat or home, this kind of coziness, and then the transparency of the building itself, right? Like, um, with it's completely glass. I mean, that that's such a statement, I guess, from West Germany as well, which makes a lot of sense in, in 1958, that they would, uh, that they would create such a building. Um, and I think this is also something that appeared in um, uh, in various, uh, what's the word in English for Botschaften, <laughs> uh, across the world for Germany. So they're, they're embassies across the world. So this was something that that was reflected, uh, not just in, in that one moment. Um, That's right. So the glass, the transparency, even the horizontality of the buildings was seen as somehow more democratic as a response to the soaring verticality of the 1937 Trocadero shows with kind of Albert Speer's designs and the statuary and the rest. All this is seen as the kind of visual vocabulary of a new West German liberalism. But as Jane was saying, if you look at the design pavilions of let's say Eastern European countries, it actually doesn't all, it doesn't look all that different. I mean, it'd be slightly more modest in its design. But if you look at Hungary, for example, mm -hmm. it was a very important effort on the part of the Hungarian government to, to convey a different kind of Hungary after the uprising of 1956. So there was a very important kind of story of cultural diplomacy for the Hungarians and each one of these countries is in a sense using this, Yugoslavia as well, as a way of in a sense advancing a different kind of image. Yugoslavia also is a kind of, a, you know, third way, a, a different kind of uh, non-Soviet socialist republic. And so that became a very, very important exhibition for a kind of fronting a range of different national identities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, someone who, or one country, someone, one country who wasn't present um, at the World's Fair in Brussels was East Germany, which was already a country. Um, they, like you said, Paul, they were also kind of omitted uh, from this, from the, the map of Germany in a strange way. Um, so their entire existence was ignored. Uh, at, at, this, at the World's Fair, but they did have their own uh, trade fair, the Leipzig trade fair that was uh, held twice a year. Um, and this was also an event, I think, where political propaganda um, was very important. And there were many international guests at the Leipzig trade fair and you had, you know, you had Wartburg uh, cars next to toys, next to furniture from Hellerau. Um, I guess, uh, what was like the, the political messaging at these events like? And, um, and, and what would have been the, here in, in the GDR, what would have been the intent of these kind, this kind of messaging in an event like this? Jane, you want me to do that? You want to go ahead, Jane? Please? You make a start. <laughs> um, I mean, the messaging would be, you know, predictable. This is kind of, the, you know, the best design from, 
from the German Democratic Republic. But if you look at the exhibition catalogs, actually the ideology wasn't all that heavy there. Then in a sense, it's just talking about the idea of the, the progressive values, the um, you know, kind of state-of-the-art uh, industrial technology. The Leipzig Fair, of course, was an important venue, but also the, uh, the Milan uh, Triennale were also very important uh, uh, places to exhibit uh, Eastern, Eastern European kind of goods, often a kind of mix of traditional arts and crafts, often with uh, ceramics, and then also uh, kind of industrial technology around, let's say, uh, consumer machinery. And each one of those Eastern European countries, in a sense, map out that particular place, and it becomes almost a kind of international, uh, becomes a kind of national brand within a kind of broader international discussion. Mm -hmm. The Poles, for example, you know, know early on that they have a very important share of the world market in terms of uh, crockery. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then, in a sense, that becomes much more important in their uh, Milan Triennale uh, exhibitions. Well, East Germany early on was the importance of, um, you know, typewriters and radios, in a sense, more consumer electronics. But there's also a sense in which they were at least in the 50s, you know, this idea of national informed socialist and content that as much as they can in terms of the display style, often not individual objects, but often uh, displaying these objects in a series and photographing them as in a sense coming off the assembly line, as opposed to Western European objects often uh, photographed much more in terms of artistic uh, kind of singular object. So the, the, the display and the actual photography would denote which particular area, but the objects themselves are often surprisingly similar. And I think it's something yeah. that we can see with uh, retrospect, but at the time people were talking often about these, these ideological or structural differences. But I think uh, with time, uh, there does seem to be one in which they're drawing on a kind of similar uh, visual style. We, we have uh, um, an object in the exhibition currently that it's a it's a wooden bowl and it's by Horst Michel. Um, it's a East German designer, Michel. And uh, he was, uh, he actually won a prize at the Triennale um, within the German pavilion. Um, so that I find, I find very interesting that there were various East German participants in the West German, it just was called the German pavilion. Um, and so there was kind of a crossover there, strangely, um, in the midst of all of this division. Um, uh, Jane, to go back to the Leipzig trade fair, but maybe more just generally um, with like Eastern Bloc, uh, I guess um, a question that I always find so interesting and, and um, it's, it's a bigger topic, but how the question of how Western consumerist rhetoric was kind of used in these settings um, to inspire visitors and uh, because, you know, obviously the differences in this time are, are so, it's, it's so binary, right? It's really like consumerism or communism, or this is, these are the messaging that, that is being shared at some of these events. And at the same time, um, they want to sell products and they want to export products. So, yeah. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I'm afraid I, I can't talk in detail about the Leipzig trade fairs and, uh, because I haven't looked closely at that. But I think I think one, one thing that comes across and following on from Paul's points about trade fairs and uh, 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 across Europe in particular is that the, it, they are ways to demonstrate the porosity of de design kind of um, thinking, I suppose, in, in the period. They're a chance, really, for, mm. for places of kind of informal cultural exchange, perhaps just simply to look and see, and mm. for some designers and for uh, manufacturers, the opportunity to travel. Although obviously there were restrictions on that, so you know they, they, they are a platform for that exchange of ideas. Um, they're not just a place for the doing of business, if you like. Um, I think I think that what maybe you're getting at is, is something about the way in which. Um, consumerism itself or the, the wants and the, the way in which design could serve the wants and needs of, of people were framed differently um, in the, I think in the, in the period really from the, especially from the late 50s, the, where, where we have various forms of economic miracle or recovery um, mm -hmm. being expressed and the tension, I suppose, between, um, you know, uh, uh, lifestyle goods, what, what may have been seen as a, seen of as in the West as kind of lifestyle goods were perhaps being talked about in terms of kind of efficiency and productivity and, you know, a language of good living really within the home, um, uh, which, which uh, was really about forms of citizenship, I suppose, performing your citizenship well. Um, uh, whereas I think obviously in the, the, in the West, you see forms of, you know, 
ideas of consumer choice being a way of expressing your democratic freedom. Um, so you do see there's a, there's a, there is a different rhetoric around everyday goods that whether or not these are the goods that are being used within the home, because of course, when we're talking about um, uh, 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 cultural exhibitions or even trade fairs, often what's being presented are the goods being produced by design institutes. They're not necessarily the things that are, um, they may only be being produced for export or they, they, they may not be being produced in a way that kind of, you know, gets into the market in a real sense. Hmm. In the, the, so, the, Paul, the, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just, um, because when we're talking about the similarities between the two of them, um, it just made me think of, we have these quotes in the exhibition, kind of like uh, one whole wall, it's just quotes East and West, and you don't really know where they're from. And they they could be from either country, except with little details, right? Like um, words like socialism, not that little, but uh, you, you get the point. Um, and, but the main kind of, the main uh, goal of both of these countries in the 1950s or one of the main goals is, like you said, um, kind of this ideal citizen, whether it's the socialist citizen or the democratic citizen, free citizen, but also the eradication of kitsch is so extremely important. Uh, Paul, can you speak to that? Why that is such a priority? Um, well, again, it, it is, and you're right. If you look through the cultural journals, both in the East and West in the kind of 40s and 50s is this desperate effort to root out what they feel to be the dangers of kitsch. Now, kitsch, of course, is a, you know, it's a quite capacious, expansive idea of what they actually mean. It often ends up being a rejection of certain ideas of the past, right? At times, you know, they're dancing around this idea of what they mean by Nazi culture. Yeah. Uh, so that often was equated with um, pastoral kind of romanticism, blood and soil, uh, anti-modernism. And that was a particular reading of Nazi culture. It was actually quite convenient to, in a sense, describe it that way, because then it made it easier then to establish links between, let's say, the 1920s and the 1950s, and, and of course, the rehabilitation of Bauhaus modernism, first in the West, then in the East, becomes a kind of way of, of in a sense, circumventing the kind of toxic zone of what happened uh, Nazi culture, which of course was borrowing a lot on ideas of modernism, but that particular idea of a kind of Nazi modernism was completely uh, a taboo in the 50s and 60s, as they're really, in a sense, um, they have a lot at stake in fencing off the Weimar Republic from the Nazi period and then the Nazi period from what came after. So that was, in a sense, part of this. So the struggle or, or the campaign against kitsch was often a way of turning the page, they felt, on an unwanted past. And then also to, you know, uh, drive forward with this idea of good form, a kind of union of morality and aesthetics. Um, functionalism became for some a particular idea of not wasting material, a kind of the, it's not hidden with historicist decoration that seems more honest and transparent. And both Germanys, in a sense, identify this particular good form ideology as in a sense, a kind of a brand uh, for what the country's doing both nationally and internationally. So the kind of struggle against kitsch was, mm -hmm. was a way of, in a sense, consigning um, uh, kind of enemy aesthetics. And that could be anything from at times Jugendstil, it could be to what they feel to be folkishness or anything they felt to be kind of unattractive, all under that umbrella as a way of, uh, of putting that past away and then promoting uh, a new, more kind of modern uh, style for the present. Those are very specific um, reasonings for German design, but uh, Jane, maybe what about internationally, other um, argumentation for modernism in this period? Well, I was thinking, as Paul, was, as Paul spoke, I was thinking, of course, when we talk about exhibitions of design in Europe in the period, and we think about American design or a kind of, um, the export of a, 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 a form of US cultural diplomacy around the world, obviously not just to Europe. Mm. Um, we're talking about the, um, the migration of modernism from Europe to the United States and then back again in the form of a, right. an exported American modernism. It's a very particular form of uh, design that's often being presented through exhibitions. It's not the only form of American cultural diplomacy taking place. You could talk about Hollywood and you could talk about the way in which modern art or various forms of art were used. Um, but for design, it is about, I, I suppose we ought to think about who are the gatekeepers of design for um, uh, in this form of cultural diplomacy. And it is the Museum of Modern Art in, 
in New York who are often working in collaboration, collaboration in, in, in tandem with um, government departments to put together exhibitions of touring uh, design and those exhibitions of touring design feature, you know, they're, they're a kind of the, the sort of classic roll call of uh, international modernism that we recognize in museum collections around the world now. It's, um, you know, it's the Eames, uh, uh, it's, um, um, you've mentioned Noel already. So there are uh, uh, companies which acquire a kind of the, the um, international status through this, um, uh, this exploitation of, of, of a kind of um, uh, European modernism that has been Americanized, I suppose. And that goes all over the world, you know, these, these traveling collections of uh, good design uh, um, uh, go to, um, they go th through, through India, across Europe and, uh, and so on. And that's reflected in architectural debates as well. So it's a particular form of design that is being, that is being exported. Mm. Can I just kind of come in on that quickly? Is that okay? Mm. I mean, I, th I think I completely agree with that. But one thing I think that distinguishes German design East and West in that story is that it's the design enabled both West and East German designers to establish distance from their superpower patrons. Um, and that may sound a little strange, especially within the West German story, the kind of Americanization of West Germany. But if you look at the design journals in the, in the 40s and 50s, I mean, the figure that attracts the most animus is, is the French American designer, Raymond Lowy. They go on and on and on about the fact that this kind of streamlining design that was used for, let's say, pencil sharpeners in the 1950s, this is a kind of decadence. And uh, it's in a sense, a kind of bad form as opposed to good form. And it became a place then that they could rehabilitate not just Bauhaus modernism, but in a sense, their own cultural traditions as, as a way of fending off what they feel to be the unwanted uh, influence of the United States. And I mean, as Jane said, Charles Eames was, of course, the great exception. He was a beloved figure and seen as a kind of pole star, but a kind of an American exception. They, in a sense, the vilification of Raymond Lowy became, became a way to, to, in a sense, mark out a kind of West German uh, design identity. And in the East, of course, it's also interesting because the Soviet Union didn't offer uh, East Germans anything. It's uh, the East, you know, East German design tradition was much further along. And in a funny way, in that way, the periphery was much more the avant-garde than the center in terms of the, the, you know, the Western countries of the Eastern Bloc, Czechoslovakia in particular, and East Germany. So they didn't need then to learn from the Soviet Union in the way that they were, they had to uh, kind of obey the dictates of socialist realism, let's say in literature and painting, mm. uh, even architecture, design enabled them to kind of uh, rehabilitate their own tradition. And so eventually the rehabilitation of, um, of Bauhaus modernism for Eastern, uh, East Germans also became a way of fending off superpower influence. So in a funny way, I think the, the Germans uh, use that, that they, in a sense, they use design as a way of of, of reclaiming um, some cultural autonomy in, an, in a period in which actually, especially in the East, uh, it's very, very difficult to do so. And I think that actually makes it quite unique. Yeah, I think that's very interesting also given, you know, in the catalog, you, you wrote about Wilhelm Wagenfeld and this kind of singular figure and how he's transcended all of these different political systems of Germany and his form of modernism has come to represent all of them and they've used, they've employed his his pieces for, for their means, um, even East Germany. Um, I guess I, I wonder who are the other kind of, who are these other protagonists that are outside of Germany, um, Jane, maybe um, that have transcended this kind of understanding of modernism from one system to another? Did you come across any in your-, well, I, in your I was thinking the example of uh, Czech, uh, Czech glass, I think, which is just, just it does illustrate Paul's point about how design uh, and in, or in the applied arts became a space in which, um, well, perhaps less policed in a sense, you know, that the, the, where, where aesthetic, um, sta <laughs> aesthetic standards might be policed more, more carefully in say literature or in painting. The applied arts remained a space where um, ideas of modernism, homegrown ideas of modernism could be explored further mm. and, and often in ways that where uh, designers found space, uh, designers and artists found space, with, where they found studio space, they found time, they found industry partners, um, where they might uh, uh, um, experiment in, in, in ways that they couldn't have done in other, 
types of practice. So with Czech glass, for example, which is the extraordinary form of cultural production in this period, um, the work becomes, you know, bigger, more sculptural, technically uh, extraordinary and experimental, highly experimental um, as forms of kind of, you know, a, a modern sculpture, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And so, and it seems to be something to do with that combination of art and industry um, that, that, that made it allowable. Mm. I think that's right. I mean, these are, you know, these were design practices that were very, very tied to the international markets. And the, the, in this design, you know, whether it be Polish ceramics or Czech glass or Eastern, you know, East German uh, typewriters, whatever, I mean, you know, there was a large um, kind of market dimension to this. And so the state in a funny way, especially in East Germany, this in a sense backed off and allowed them to, uh, to design as long as they could kind of hit those, you know, the export uh, revenue. So it was in a funny way that because it was tied to industry, it then gave those successful design schools and, des and industries uh, more room to design and, and to recoup that modernist tradition as given the fact that it had a, an important uh, economic dimension in conjunction with this idea of a certain idea of cultural identity with it. Yeah, I mean, we're speaking about uh, glass and porcelain or um, tableware from Wagenfeld. But um, Cold War Modern, which we'll speak about <laughs> briefly, uh, there are some more overt examples, I think, of this Cold War aesthetic. I mean, I'm thinking about like uh, Bucky and the geodesic dome or, you know, these kinds of things. This isn't something that we have in, in the exhibition because we've kind of, um, it's, an, it's a design exhibition, but it's really an industrial design exhibition and it's a bit smaller, but I think, um, are, in your research, either one of you, I guess, um, have there been examples of German design that is so overtly political that you can think of? Because I kind of, I feel like that's another case where I feel like uh, maybe there was some kind of avoidance there happening as well, um, compared to places like, well, the superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union, um, where a lot of things were obviously developed for military first and then became uh, you know, consumer goods, or became pop culture. I mean, uh, you're giving you you give the example of the Buckminster Fuller Geodesic Dome, which mm. in our, our exhibition we use as an example of technological acceleration, which is kind of hugely de defining feature of the period, but also one where a Cold War object, for want of a better term, or Cold War technology, when the kind of full cycle, I suppose, from being produced uh, for um, military use, then was translated into, I suppose, a more you know, a diplomatic use that, that uh, the geodesic dome was of course an excellent form for exhibition pavilions. So it was literally exported all over the world to, mm. uh, to house exhibitions. And then it gets adopted kind of by the counterculture and by experimental architects as a form, um, you know, partly because it's uh, reproducible, it's cheap to make and, and and it seems to have the sort of relative freedom and flexibility that architects were looking for in the 60s. So, you know, it becomes almost an element in that kind of archigram, futuristic um, uh, kind of form of late modernism. Um, I mean, that's it's a very unique example, I suppose. There are examples, of course, of technologies that transfer across sectors, um, but perhaps not one that has such a sort of, I suppose, iconic kind of... Um, uh, 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 kind, kind of a, um, a trajectory behind it. I mean, I think when you talk about the changing, if we've talked about the changing image of certain sort of forms of design or products in the period, I think the story of East German plastics is a really great one mm. to follow through. Um, and you you tell it in the catalogue and, and, um, and, and I'm sure that's really clear in the exhibition that what you have here is, you know, a very, an, an obvious form of, East German uh, modernity um, and one that clearly shows the relationship to um, uh, the Soviet Union and this, the kind of provision of raw material and the, the freedom pipeline um, for, for, for oil that kind of comes through Poland and into East Germany and then results in this kind of you know, outpouring of brightly colored and quite experimental but sort of cheap utilitarian goods 
and you know the catalogue makes the comparison I suppose with the image of plastic goods in the west is sometimes being seen as cheap and throwaway but then of course you get this kind of fun this this um transition into a completely different rhetoric in the early 70s with um the uh, uh the club of rome and the limits to growth debates debates about ecology and uh the uh, you know the, the kind of crisis around opec and so oil plastics take mm. on a completely different status um, uh, through the 70s so that's a really great way i think of telling a story of everyday goods with, with which kind of sort of caught in this net of cold war tensions and and, and, and debates i think mm, I, yeah. I think that's right and I, I can i add a few i mean in terms of aesthetics that become dangerous or highly politicized I and mean, then i was just thinking maybe not in the world of consumer goods, but in a sense, obviously, let's say a punk look in East Germany in the early 1980s in terms of what that represented for many people in terms of what those uh, young people look like, the haircuts and the rest, and why that was seen as such an affront to kind of East German uh, culture at the time. Or, you know, look, think of the RAF, uh, you know, bombings of uh, department stores. I mean, that was one in which they clearly had a, you know, for them, consumer goods had taken on a political importance. And the idea of actually setting bombs in these in these uh, kind of temples of consumerism was considered as a statement. But I, like Jane, I was also thinking about the military issue because it's, you know, again, you're not alone. I think and people doing uh, design exhibitions and catalogs rarely include military design. But of course, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's a design aspect that's important. And I was thinking that I've done some kind of recent research. I mean, let's say when East Germany is in a sense expanding outward to Africa in the 1960s and 70s, they're often, uh, in conjunction with their East Bloc uh, counterparts, they're in a sense, you know, helping a number of these newly decolonized countries to modernize. And, you know, the East Germans send a lot of, uh, let's say, you know, radio equipment, they help them set up uh, presses, but they also send a lot of um, Stasi surveillance um, equipment. That was, in a sense, East German design. And so, in a sense, that's what they're uh, sending as a kind of package on what um, Eastern European modernization might mean uh, for these new countries in terms of these new states that want to make sure that they've got their rival, you know, you know, uh, 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 political factions rest under more surveillance. So in a sense, the, the design of these uh, new radio stations or surveillance equipment, all these kinds of things in what used to be known as the, the third world, the kind of uh, um, the global south is, is part of that design story as well. And that's certainly the way people on the receiving end of those particular development packages often understood the differences between, let's say, the Czechs, the East Germans, the West Germans, in terms of what they're being offered in terms of kind of material infrastructure assistance. I so. think that's interesting also in relation to um, how the material culture of East Germany is kind of uh, disappearing and uh, it, it re, it, it, it's rediscovered in, in countries where East Germany was present. Um, actively uh, politically present. And so like, for example, we have the Samsung, uh, which is the um, motorbike that uh, is kind of this beloved motorbike from East Germany because it actually can go a bit faster than German motorbikes are allowed to go nowadays. So it's kind of has a special permission to do that, but it was also exported to many countries and it's it's unbreakable. You can't, you cannot break this this bike. So it's kind of, it, it lives in all these other uh, contexts and it kind of keeps things lively, even though in Germany itself, it's become less of a, now it's it's coming back, but it, it, it become kind of this symbol of this decline, uh, you know, failing state. Um, I was also going to say uh, that, oh yeah, because you mentioned this, this idea of the military design. I, 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 I don't know if both of you were able to see the exhibition at the Design Museum Den Bosch in the Netherlands on National Socialist Design. Mm -hmm. uh, this was, I believe, two years ago. It was definitely before COVID. And they had, um, at the very end of the exhibition, they had three helmets exhibited, and one of those helmets was um, the one that ultimately was used in the GDR. Uh, and so it remained the helmet for the people's police in the GDR, which I find really interesting because it was really well designed, but apparently Hitler did not approve of it because it wasn't, the shape of it wasn't really the most beautiful. Um, anecdotally though. Um, let's just briefly uh, get to uh, the exhibition itself and, and really your exhibition, Jane, um, Cold War Modern, uh, design 1945 to 1970, which was by all uh, 
by all accounts, very groundbreaking. Um, and uh, I've, I've read about it and I've read about you speaking about it. And there was initially a lot of skepticism about taking on tackling this topic as an exhibition. Uh, can you speak to that a bit? What, what was that about? What was the skepticism? A little, yes, it was over 10 years ago now. Uh, and the exhibition with my, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, David Crowley, um, uh, we, well, the context for it was we proposed an exhibition to the, the v &A, uh, uh, where I was based at the time and David had um, worked closely with for many years in, a, in the context of a series of exhibitions about 20th century modernity. So it was, it was a, the following on from an exhibition around uh, pre-war modernism, which Paul was in, involved with and, and, and David too. And so we, we wanted to put a different um, framework, I suppose, around uh, an, a design exhibition um, and uh, proposed the idea of using the Cold War as a lens with which to understand the development of modernism in the post-war period up to the early 1970s. Um, and yes, there was there was some skepticism around this. I think the, the, the idea that the subject and the title, Cold War Modern, um, might be challenging to visitors and, and uh, uh, may, may also um, uh, be off-putting perhaps to, to people. So we, we, had, we had some fight around that, but the museum was very supportive in the, the research project that we tried to develop. I think the interesting discussions we had really were, we did go, we had the opportunity to go all over the world really, um, but especially across Europe, talking to different curators in museum collections. And actually at the time, probably trying to unearth stories of Cold War design that weren't on display or hadn't been told before, that may be held by collections uh, in Prague or in Warsaw or in Moscow and in places that was difficult. I mean, people felt that sometimes we might be trying to showcase stories of design that they didn't consider to be canonical. They didn't consider to be perhaps good design, but actually as, and we had a few failures, people who weren't really interested in, <laughs> in working with us. But for the most part, what we discovered was an enormous amount of knowledge and, and kind of um, curiosity about the subject. And so it was in the end, a big international collaboration with curators from, from really all over the world. Um, and we hope, we, we just tried to, as I said, view design through a different lens or put a different frame around thinking about objects. Um, you don't have to call these objects Cold War objects. There are many other things beside that. But for the purpose of the exhibition, we tried to kind of weave a narrative, I suppose, that saw objects not, and not only as objects of propaganda. I think that's probably my, my one of my last points would be that um, initially people thought we were going to do an exhibition about design and propaganda, and we weren't doing that. We wanted to think about objects that were both um, they, they, they may be state-sponsored design examples. They might be examples, um, as we've discussed with the examples already, of how design often works kind of um, under the radar or against the grain of, of um, uh, state policies um, and how objects worked as kind of um, agents or diplomats of, of um, Cold War exchange. Hmm. What, what, what were the challenges of working with um, objects that, and this is your term, living memory, um, that kind of are just so loaded to people today that have, you know, existed in this, in the regime, that, whichever one it was, let's say. Yeah, I mean, memory and Paul's worked on it, you know, me me memory, uh, that at, at the time, I think we were really coming out of a period where in which the debates around East German nostalgia uh, uh, or, uh, were, were very, very live. And so there was a sense in which we're trying to understand how visitors might respond to these things. They might respond um, to them as historical artifacts. They might, they might be prompts to personal memories. They might be quite kind of emotional, I think, um, to, to people of a certain generation. And actually the themes for many people Although the exhibition focused on the period from the 50s to the 70s, of course, one thing we found was a lot of people were talking about the, the rise again of kind of a Cold War tensions in the 80s. It was a period in which I grew up, you know, where, where um, 
So they could recognize those debates. They could recognize things around nuclear anxiety. Um, and then of course, in the context of the kind of fall of the wall. So it did trigger a lot of it really interesting discussion about where, as many subjects can, where museums bring together, I suppose, the sort of, um, you know, scholarship and history with personal memory. Mm -hmm. And then you leave it to the visitor, you know, it's they make their, their stories from what they see. Yeah, um, Paul, you you wrote a book um, uh, within walls about the the private life of the German Democratic Republic. Uh, what what brought you to that? Because we were just for me the link here was private life, the private dwelling, uh, the personal memory. There's so much nostalgia or nostalgie in the case of East Germany. Um, what what brought you to that specific title? Well, I had written a book on um, West German industrial design and I uh, want, well, actually when I started that project, I wanted to do a comparison between West and East Germany. And at that point, the Amt für Industrielle Fondgestaltung, the East German Design Council uh, in the early nineties closed right after reunification. So I, as a result, I could only do just the West German side of it. Um, mm, yeah. So then I decided I wanted to Kind of investigate uh, the East German design culture, uh, and I started doing that kind of work. And there's a chapter there on on some of those design debates in the 1950s and 60s around some of these exhibitions, etc. But then I thought, actually, now that I'm starting a new project, why don't I just fan this out to talk about how people not just understood their um, domestic interiors and the relationship between people and objects, but actually how they understood their private lives. And to a lot of people, there was a lot of skepticism when I started that project. People said, uh, one, one particular uh, very well-known colleague in my field said, you know, private life in the GDR sounds like a very short book, <laughs> meaning that there wasn't any. And so uh, one of the, you know, claims I was trying to make in that book was to say it actually mattered a great deal to people. And in, um, in, a, in, a, in a state and society in which there was no real public sphere, uh, in terms of you know a kind of contested um, public debate, actually the private sphere became even more important for people. So mm -hmm. that was something that I had to work through at lots of different case studies and um, and sources to show that that I mean it, the the irony was of course that everybody knew, meaning the state and citizens knew there was no such thing as a as a pure private sphere. Um, but as a result everybody had a stake in maintaining that fiction. In other words, the state wanted to say, we're not like uh, the way things used to be in the 1930s. We respect the division between public and private and allow people after work to have a place of repose. The people living in these buildings knew that, you know, there could be, you know, uh, uh, housing authorities, the Stasi could bear down on them any moment that their front door was not necessarily a closure from the world of surveillance in terms of the wiretapping and the rest, but they had a stake in maintaining that division as a way of guarding some modicum of individuality in their private life. So that was kind of interesting to see that it was uh, one in which everybody knew it was a kind of shared fiction, but it, people a lot, had a lot at stake in maintaining that for various political reasons. So that was something I was kind of interested in trying to tell that story. You said uh, that you initially wanted to write a book about both Germanys together. And, and this I found interesting because this exhibition, uh, German Design 19, I'm gonna uh, advertise a little, German Design 1949 to 1989, which is currently on display. Um, we, this is really one of the first times that this has been done, surprisingly, and it's been 30 years, it's been over 30 years since the Berlin Wall fell. And this is a very, it's been very um, provocative somehow to just do one exhibition for both Germanys. I think it would have almost been easier to do an exhibition on German and Italian design. And actually that exhibition already happened. So, so I, I, I wonder why do you both think, uh, for both of you, why do you think there is this kind of, um, yeah, why is this such a provocation really to combine East and West German design in an exhibition? Jane, you want me to start? You can go ahead. I, I think I, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I hadn't realized until you explained that it might be a provocation. And of course, we're think, thinking about this from outside of Germany. So I think my perspective is probably a, a, a different. I, I think maybe, maybe partly it might be about the form that people assume exhibitions might take. And although I haven't seen your exhibition, but I've read the catalogue, which is fantastic. I kind of Thank can you. see the way in which, you know, you're weaving together lots of different stories, not a straightforward um, vice, you know, a kind of um, vice versa model. And actually that was something that we were 
presented with as a, as a problem when we first started our exhibition really was that we wanted to look at the subject from multiple perspectives. We weren't going to run a wall down the middle of the gallery and have kind of east on one side and west on the other okay. and ask people to make straightforward comparison. That's absolutely not what, 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 what it's about or what, what it should be about. So, you know, I think maybe that's, that is the provocation that people think perhaps it is a straightforward good or better comparison or 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 um and that actually what you're telling is stories of a, a kind of migration and changing identity and you know uh, uh, uh parallels and breaks i suppose are much more complicated than that that binary right mm -hmm. i think that's right um i mean as you know it's not completely true that people weren't interested in making these comparisons you say there was you know a first exhibition 1984 in the GDR of West uh, German design, one in 1988, in which East German design was featured in an exhibition in Stuttgart. So there was a lot of interest in the 1980s in looking across the wall. And then, the, you know, the interesting thing is why that completely died off after reunification. Suddenly that, that story of kind of, uh, you know, Western arrogance that this is all subpar, poorly designed things. But I was just listening to the um, opening panel in German, the one that you had, I must have been a couple of weeks ago, and there was a um, designer there from East Germany. And he was saying how little that they knew about um, West German design and vice versa. So I found that part of the provocation, I think you're right to do it. And I think it's a really, really good catalog and exhibition is to put two countries together in terms of their design heritage. And I think the similarities are there. And I like the fact that it's a very balanced tone, which is something you also had uh, in Jane's exhibition. You know, what, so that, you know, that's an important thing. But then the question is, as this designer was saying, if the consciousness of the of the what do you want to call it double national history is not there to kind of put them next to each other, I think the objects speak for a certain relationship, but mm. the people themselves often did have the consciousness that there was something called a kind of common German German heritage. So that's kind mm. of something, I guess, presumably, that happened. Um, it's, it's partly in the eighties, but it certainly happened after the fact. And I guess the question I have for you as a curator is that I was kind of curious and I was wondering why, you know, why end in 89? Because it's kind of the implication is that in the last 30 years, do you think that's a new chapter of German design? Now the fact that the country is unified, I mean, you certainly have very important regional design centers, but what has happened, you know, there was a lot of creative tension with that division for 40 years, which in a sense gave rise to two design cultures with actually a range of commonalities. So now kind of post, <laughs> post 90, to split it that way in terms of a reunification, what's your sense of you had to do a kind of a sequence chapter in terms of, is it just still drawing on an old, you know, now at this point, a canonical tradition, or do you get the feeling there are new shoots and developments that make this look historical, or is this part of a kind of extended present of German design from the 49 to the present? Well, uh, the short answer to your question as to why we didn't include until today is probably time and space, which Jane <laughs> knows very well. I mean, I, I think um, just looking at the pictures of Cold War Modern, there must have been 500 exhibits. Uh, we've we've got over 350 with every, if you count every saucer and every uh, spoon. Um, and, you know, we wanted it to be comprehensive because we felt like that was the burden that we had for doing this the first time. And sure, we, we invite, you know, other exhibitions um, and scholarly work to tackle putting the two together and seeing what comes out. Um, but I do think, yeah, it's interesting to look back the past 30 years and ask the question of if we could do an exhibition at all and say it's German design, because I think most German designers wouldn't call themselves German designers at all. Uh, you know, Konstantin Richich, who did the exhibition design, I asked him that in another talk I did with him and, and I worked with him very closely and he, he's kind of like, this is, you know, not at all how he would define his work as being German because he works in a globalized world. Most of his training was in the UK. So, I mean, a lot of it is also just chance, I think, as well, because 1989 is also the year that uh, you know, the internet, commercial use of the internet happened. So things really opened up for everybody, not just for Germany as well. Um, and I guess maybe they were lucky in a fact, in a sense, because had it been a little bit later, um, reunification, people might have been really left behind. But because of that, that timing, uh, it worked out really well. Um, I don't know, Jane, do you have other thoughts on that as a, as a, as the other curator in the, 
I was only thinking, I suppose, of what what is, you know, perhaps a different tack, which was what is special to, if you're trying to write a, if you're trying to produce a narrative of, a, of, 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 of um, two nations side by side, how would the how would the cultural history of that be different if you weren't using design? So what's what's very yeah. particular about a design exhibition is also that you have a kind of you have the shared common thread of the Bauhaus running through this. This is this is clearly and actually having just kind of come out of the centenary celebrations for the Bauhaus and the notion of a global Bauhaus having been um, you know the subject of a series of exhibitions. Um, um, across the world, you know. So the Bauhaus is a really kind of defining factor in the history of design. And I suppose one might say architecture, but particularly design in the post-war period. I know there've been exhibitions and there was one at, at LACMA um, uh, some years ago on the art of two Germanys. Mm, and it would be interesting to say, what's the cultural history? What's the difference in the cultural history there if you're using different media? If you mm. did something around film, if you looked at performance, what you know would that without that common thread is it a different kind of story i suppose but that's a very yeah. open question I yeah think. we'll see who who comes up with the next exhibition i i look forward to seeing it <laughs> and being but i do visitor. think i think jane is right i mean i think my feeling is design's the only cultural field that you could actually do this uh this common german german history i think if you move into film uh, literature, architecture, painting. I think that the only other place would possibly, I think photography maybe, um, in which they're also drawing on a, a, you know, similar kinds of styles. But I think the differences would far outweigh the similarities in every other field hmm. design, even if people are not, weren't that conscious of those similarities. And it even many designers themselves are not comfortable with the idea of tagging themselves as either a West or East German designer or a German designer at all. I think that's possible. I think it'd be much harder to do uh, with the kind of media, let's say, that Jane was doing in her exhibition in terms of thinking about, you know, let's say fashion and uh, film and a whole range of other things. I think design is, makes that possible, but that, you know, raises the issue, what makes that story so unique, um, not just for Germany's, Germany in the world, but in terms of the broader, um, cultural landscape in Germany, what, you know, what made that story, those bridges and the kind of porous Cold War possible in a way that I think that's not the case for lots of other fields. Hmm. Well, again, I, I look forward to those future exhibitions that someone else will be organizing as a visitor. I'm already excited about them. Uh, I think uh, we've, we've, um, we're about finished. So I would like to thank you both again, sincerely for talking to me today in conjunction with the exhibition. And I truly hope that you can both at some point soon come see it. If it's not in Vanamlein, then the second venue will be Dresden um, starting in October, 2021. And following Dresden, the exhibition, as I said before, will tour internationally for up to five years. So we look forward to sharing all of these exhibits with people in lots of different contexts. Um, thank you both. And for all of you watching, um, this video will also be posted on our YouTube channel and will be available at a later date. So check it out. And thank you so much.